I'm just gonna hit record. So I'm here with my buddy Andrew. Andrew, you and I have known each other for what ever. I think my mom actually called you to cut the cord when I was born. <laughs> it's been a long time, my friend. It's been a while. Um, one of the first people to ever pay me money for information. You were. I don't know if did you know that. No, uh, no, I did. I, I, I remember when you were first kind of getting started, like 2015, 20, uh, 2015, 2016 ish. Really? 2017. Yeah, it was 2017. Was it? I had a business before 2017 that I owned, but it was not in the digital market yeah. space. Because I, I can clearly recall you had a program that was just specifically around getting new uh, agency clients, right? And at that time, I was really gung ho on local business marketing, which I still am to a degree, but I, I, I do everything now, but you started your first program, which if I recall, was about how to cold call and cold email and yeah. fill up your pipeline. Right. And then that yeah. turned into the whole build your agency model and yeah, get people say, prospecting for you. I've sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of that particular course. I yeah. think by the end of it, I had sold like well over 400 memberships into it. And um, I don't have a friendship with all of them. I, I can only remember a few on my hand and you're the first one. Hmm. So there's a few people in life where you meet them and you, you just know when you meet them, this person's going to be in my life quite some time, maybe not consistently all the time, maybe six months pass and we're living in our worlds, doing our thing, doing our grind. But you know, there's certain friends in life where you, you connect with them. And then you, when you reconnect, periodically it's like no time has passed in between and the only thing that has changed in that amount of time is I went from like you hiring me as like this teacher for the program to I feel like in the last I don't know however many years 70 years I've become more the student of just watching like the the part that you've gone through and I think part of the reason for that is because you didn't just stop like, you know, some people follow a guru and I'm just going to give an example because I like the guy. It's not, but like you look at Russell Brunson and people follow him for a long time and then they cap out at a specific level of knowledge and they start feeling like, okay, I already know all these things and they're craving more. And the thing that I like is that I probably capped out in 2020, 2020. I'm always learning new things, but like, you know, it's like a kid, you absorb all this knowledge in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. There's this passionate fire where you're doing it because like you're excited. And as you're walking, you're listening to podcasts on like neuroscience and all this stuff. I can't say I do that anymore. Like right now in my spare time, I'm listening to Jimi Hendrix, John Frusciante, like guitar players. Like I'm listening to other things where you're, and I think that's why the roles reverse because you're such a student of the game in a sense. That. Well, I, I have something to say about that I find kind of interesting. You know, there's a couple kind of people out there, especially in this marketplace. You've got the Russell Brunsons of the world. And the reason a lot of people love Russell in the beginning and then feel like they kind of grow out of him is he really sticks to the zero to one category, right? He's an activator. That's his role in the marketplace. And then you get other mentors who they evolve, they grow, and they help you push past too. So I've become very fascinated by studying different market dynamic roles and it across multiple industries. Like you think of the Steve Jobs of the world. They were the people who are never content with just staying where they are. They always wanted to push forward, right? And you can kind of study how they think and how they think is in iterations. So they have one iteration at the very beginning. It's like, okay, well, we're going to create this brand new motherboard that never existed. And then to the first all-in-one computer, then to the first computer that you can see through inside now, which became the iMac in 98, and then turned in the iPhone, which was basically Mac OS 10, and then the iPad, and they keep going from there, right? And so I think to myself, how can I do that in my journey? And it's really simple. You start with where you are, you look around, and you see how far can I see ahead? And then you go there. And then when you get there, you stop look around again and see where can I go next. And I've kind of done that progressively through my journey in the last, oh, 10 plus years, mm -hmm. as long as I've been active in this business, right? And so you've seen my journey going from like, oh, I'm just going to write comic books and novels to then marketing for local businesses, bigger businesses. For a while, I was actually the uh, marketing director for a very large e-commerce company that's across the world here in that. the U.S., 
And I said, no, nah, that ain't for me. And then I went into publishing and publishing is where I really, really did well. And I found it works well for myself because I'm what you call a mechanic. I am a person who builds systems and processes, thinks in terms of those, and then thinks, where can I go next after I've built them, right? So I think of everything in terms of structure. Now, one thing I find interesting is I do this with copy as well. And you've seen me do this. I actually write the entire ad or the entire sales letter in my head before I put the first, first letter down on the page. And so what I'll do is I'll close my eyes and it will just come out. Whether I'm speaking it, whether I'm writing it, it'll just blurt itself onto the page and then I can go tweak it from there because it's never finished. Copy is a living, breathing thing. It always kind of evolves with the marketplace, right? Yeah. So that, that's why some people really outgrow is because they, they always want to think of what's the next iteration. Where am I going from here? How am I evolving? How am I adapting? And that's the people that you really see push forward and get to the top of any marketplace because they always get to that next place, look around, see where are they going, and then go from there. You know, I will say this. <clears throat> I'm not as detailed, for instance. I like I I learned that um, the not knowing what you're good at makes you really good at the things you are good at. And so some people, especially in the public eye, or if they're, you know, if they have any level of influence, even just the small amount that I have, they feel like they need to be good at all things and to be like, um, be able to be like the example for everyone. I don't feel that yeah. need um, because I know I'm not, there's many things that I'm not good at, but I'll say the one thing that has kept me relevant is what you just said about not, not just being focused on where you are. I'm always focused on where we're going i'm never mm -hmm. focused where i'm at it's kind of like that old gretzky mm -hmm. saying hit the puck where the person's at not where uh give me one sec here hit the per or hit the where they're going not where they're at right um just sending set and you look at like for instance with the software we're constantly growing pivoting and doing things that i might not have the, the skills to write the code but i can see like hey right now everyone's focused on text bots i know voice gets better conversions because i've been in agency long enough one day they're going to want their agents to be able to be in unison as an example like one day they're going to want to be able to call that text bot and the agent answers the phone and doesn't need to start over the conversation like little things like that i'm right. always thinking about those things six months ago when everyone's thinking about the and so that kind of stuff has helped keep me relevant. But. And you'll, you'll see this in the marketplace too. And this kind of ties into the philosophy of how I run ads. So you'll notice many people teaching things in the marketplace. It's typically stuff that works six to 18 months before they started teaching it. Right. And then by the time they start to teach it, it doesn't quite work as well. But when you're running software, when you're out there doing it, when you're showing what's working right now, it's a completely different story. Right. Yeah. And so there's so many marketers and so many offer owners who are building offers on, on things that they did in the past. And that's great. But I think there's a very select few who are kind of innovative and in thinking about well, what's coming down the pipeline in the next six to 18 months, not what's the previous six to 18 months. And I think if you can kind of put your mind there, you'll get ahead. Yeah. You know what? It's funny you say that because, like, if you think of a wave, most marketers don't start actually uh creating content and building products for some a, a problem or something right. specific until the wave is already there and maybe even starting to topple over and then they wonder mm -hmm. why is it that every three months i have to come up with a new product mm -hmm. it's because you caught the wave at the end yeah it's uh there's a scientific term for it i think it's the diffusion of innovation if i recall it's literally a chart where it's two percent um What's his name? Nick. Uh, I know exactly who you're talking about. Peterson. Guy, right? Nick Peterson. Yeah. From my yeah. event. I think mm -hmm. he has a whole like thing on diffusion of innovation. To be honest with you, though, and I'm just going to throw this out there and you know this as a copywriter. I've never used that word because while it sounds fancy, I don't think anyone understands it other like what the word means other than maybe you and Nick um right. until it's explained <laughs> so i just like to say the wave well all, all innovation is is just progressive change over time right because all things change 
I mean, that's literally what time is. Time itself is change. You cannot have change at that time. It's not possible. Yeah. And so as you see people going up that diffusion of innovation, you understand how they make buying decision. And that's what economics is. Economics is just the study of how people make decisions. And money is tied to decision. Right. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question real quick. I want to tw- change the topic here just a little bit. So um, six months ago, if I can ask, this is a weird question. What were yeah. you doing six months ago? What time is it? September. So that would have been March. Yeah. I, I was really focused back in March and still CMO clients because that was my big pull for such a long time. For many years, I, I've had really two focuses I focused on publishing and then CMO, right? And so I didn't want to just sell ads. I didn't just want to sell email. I wanted to sell all in one packages. And then I felt the market kind of shifting. And that that took me by surprise a little bit, to be frank. But then I pivoted back into doing ads primarily for clients and then writing lots of ads. I got to a point where I'm still writing between five to 15 ads every single day for clients and just popping them out left and right because I'm a machine like that. But back then, I was still really focused on CMO as a primary service on the agency side of things. The reason I asked that, when did you figure out this algorithm ad account thing? I probably knew it for at least one year, but it didn't really become mentally conscious until about like April to May. So here's the thing that I think is kind of amazing about it. For people listening, you know, I've heard people who are talking about growing YouTube accounts, Instagram accounts saying, yeah. Start with like three to five accounts, post on all of them, see which ones are getting traction, you know, go with those accounts. Uh, I never thought in a million years about doing a series of tests for um, a series of tests for this, you know, for an ad account, because I just assumed, well, that's because it's organic when you're doing paid. You know, paid ads are, you know, it shouldn't have any effect on the algorithm. What got you thinking, hey, I should test this? Well, what really got me thinking was about a year and a half ago, I was running a really big offer where I was spending, I think, between one to two thousand dollars a day of my own money on that particular offer. And I saw some weird trends start to happen in that account, right? There were things that used to work one way, then they stopped working and things that worked another way that I never thought in a million years would work. And I said, okay. Well, that's interesting. And I heard a couple of friends talk about, well, if you just create a new ad account, maybe it will fix it. Maybe it will stabilize. But then I created that second ad account for that dog campaign and it worked completely different. I'm like, huh, that's fascinating. So I was in a, as a mentorship at the time where I paid the guy $20,000 and I said, what do you think about this? Like, is it true there are variations in the algorithm? Because that's what I'm seeing. I'm experimenting. Here's the hard data. I mean, I've created a couple of different campaigns in each account, seeing it work differently. And he goes, well, that's just not true, Andrew. There's only one algorithm and it works exactly the same across every account. And so I didn't really directly rebut him at the time because I like to be polite, but I kept experimenting and testing in the background, creating more ad accounts for different campaigns and seeing how it worked and operated. And I kind of realized if you were to create five different accounts and you did the exact same thing in every account, you're gonna get five different results. And so that brought up a question, why is that? What causes that? And so I said, okay, well, it's clearly obvious that every account is not the same because I'm testing the exact same structures, the exact same ads, the same copy, the same images, the same headlines, the same sales pages, literally everything is identical and yet all the accounts are doing different things. If there's one algorithm, it makes no sense. And we know that this is true because Facebook themselves even confirmed it at multiple points. Like, hey, we're rolling out different features, different ad accounts, and there's different settings are going to be available. And we're experimenting with this over here. And so you may see it. We see it all the time. One of the big changes at the moment is you may be familiar with dynamic creative ads that are turning into flexible ads. Some accounts have that. Others don't. So how can it be possible for there to be one single algorithm when multiple accounts don't even have the same features? So then do you, uh, that makes perfect sense. Do you then change your ad strategy based off of the way your ad account is rigged? Yeah. 
So you don't really know what version of the algorithm you have until you run specific tests. So what I do for every single account is I set up a base campaign. And in that campaign, you're going to start with one main campaign. It may have three ad sets and each ad set goes after a specific angle or an audience or a different kind of idea. Teaches this, right? Because I it don't does. Want you to, I'm not going to try to give away the goods of your program in there. Um, oh, let's give away some of the goods because if people really like it, they can go deeper inside the program. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and it's what? How, what's the price of the program? It's cheap. Well, for you guys, if, if you're uh, following Ross and you're listening to this podcast, it's 27 bucks. It's but if like, you were to buy it straight from me, it's 97. I just spent $9 on a coffee and a sandwich here at Starbucks. So, you know, 27 bucks. My family comes here when the four of us come, it's like 50 bucks to get to Starbucks. So, well, the reason I make it so affordable is because I want everyone to experience this. You're going to see it's true for yourself because there's no one way to run ads. You can have a hundred media buyers doing a hundred different things, all get results. Why? Because they intuitively understand, maybe even at a subconscious level, how to work with me, the algorithm. Sorry to cut you off. I was going to ask though, can you tell me of any examples from people who have implemented this and any results that you've seen on the back end? Mm -hmm. So I can tell you one campaign I'm running at the moment. I just launched a brand new offer just a week and a half ago in the Christian marriage space, like help fix your relationship, right? My father is actually the, uh, the influential figure behind that. He's an Orthodox deacon and he's done this for a long time helping people. So I set up my base campaign as normal, right? We start getting sales and I see, oh, it costs $20 to get someone to buy the front end masterclass. It's good to know. Let's start running tests. One of the tests I teach you inside the Ad Velocity Masterclass is to run cost camp, uh, cost, cost cap and cost per result goal campaigns. So I set up this new campaign. I set the campaign objective to stabilize around specific cost per results. And inside that, I created three ad sets. Ad set number one was $10. I want to get sales for 10 bucks. Ad set number two, 15. Ad set number three, 20. And of course, we're getting some at 20 still. But what's really surprising is we're getting tons and tons of sales at $10. And they're good quality customers. They're buying more. They're ascending into other offers that we have. They're upselling and we're cutting our costs for acquisition. So I go, I now know this version of the algorithm in this account supports cost per results uh, goals. So I can run that up, scale it up, spend more money, and get better quality customers at lower prices. That's, That's awesome. one tangible example. There are, there are other kind of tests too that I talk about. I talk about different testing strategies. There's two primary testing strategies that I do, whether you're going to awareness audiences and you're testing the harshest conditions possible, or you're running your main campaign and you're just creating new ad sets and you're testing inside that, right? There's multiple ways to do it. And you're going to see, based on the kind of algorithm you have, different results happening. Sometimes one way is going to work very, very, very well. Other times, the other method is going to far outperform it. Did you figure this all out on your own, or did you like learn bits and pieces from multiple people? It's both, really. No one learns anything in a vacuum. I've learned a lot from many mentors. I've probably worked with, I think, seven or eight, seven to eight different mentors at this point, specifically for Facebook ads. But a lot of this, you really kind of have to assemble yourself. I'm at the point in my life, in my career where I'll pay someone 10,000 bucks, I may learn like two or three golden nuggets and I test it and I see, does it work with the way that I operate? My philosophy, does it work well in these ad accounts? And if yes, fantastic. And if no, that's okay. Maybe another account down the line will work. So some of these things I picked up and I changed along the way. Like there's one guy, I cannot remember his name. I, I, I just can't. But I remember his whole strategy was you want to take your your cost per acquisition create a cost cap campaign and then do 1.2x so if you have a hundred dollars cost per acquisition test at 120 right and the goal there was to raise the quality of the customer so let me ask you this just because um you mentioned that that you know you'll put an investment in this and that and that and if it fits with your philosophy uh, I've never heard anyone say with my philosophy in regards to Facebook ads, mm -hmm. you know, 
most people might uh, have a specific philosophy when it comes to religion or different things. What is your philosophy for ads? Like if, if I were to just say, hey, what's your advertising philosophy? My advertising philosophy is that every single ad account has its own version of the algorithm. And if you can find what works best in your specific account, you're going to go very far, get tons of great results at far cheaper prices. If you don't find that, it's going to be difficult the entire time. You're always going to be fighting against the algorithm and you're going to fall into the mistake of just assuming it works one way when it doesn't. So let me ask you this, because this is how my advertising has always gone. I've typically, even within the same ad account, AA tested things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know a lot of people talk about AB testing. I'll literally AA test something, two different ad sets with different, um, or with the same creative, but the same targeting, you know, but they're technically two different ones. One gets phenomenal results. The other one does hardly anything. Now, as an example, let's say you're spending $100 a day on an ad set, and then you decide to duplicate it, but one at $50 a day, one at $50 a day. So you're spending the same amount daily. One is crushing it, one is not. I have always been under the impression, and I guess in my philosophy, that based off of who starts converting in the beginning of a campaign the best, Facebook continues to look for people like them because they're converting. So their avatar is what's responding to this particular ad set. And so that's how that works. You know what I mean? Because, you know, for instance, you'll find that one ad set naturally, even with open targeting, starts really converting men between you know 25 and 30 where the same targeting on another one you've got people of a different age range or different kind of device or whatever so you're saying that you know that's on a micro level the ad account level you're or at the ad set level you're saying that this goes even further at the it, it applies at all levels it applies at the account level the campaign the ad set and the ad and I'll just start on the ad and ad set for a moment because that's where most people will start testing these things. Every single ad and every ad set goes after different people, even if they have the same settings, right? So I think about Facebook as if it's a big lake. Well, this is this is true for any advertiser, but I think Facebook compared to like Google, YouTube, maybe TikTok works a little bit differently, but it's a big lake and your ad set is the fishing rod, right? So it's throwing the fish throwing the rod out to the fish, and then your ad is the bait on the end. So all the people that congregate to it are the fish. Well, sometimes you start running out of fish for that particular ad, so you can literally duplicate it, reset it, and it goes to another area of that lake. It's kind of crazy. And that's just how that version of the algorithm interacts with those specific pockets of people. So the best thing you can do in that scenario, especially if you have a lot of ad fatigue, is copy your best ads put them into a control ad set or maybe even a control campaign if you have far many and you're scaling up your account, right? And then you'll see it reset to a degree and start getting results again. Like I'll tell you really quick, one of the best things that I do for an ad account with a lot of fatigue, I will run an engagement campaign specifically to those posts IDs. So at the ads at the ad level, you will see a button that says use existing ad and you can enter the post ID into that run an engagement campaign doing that, you're going to see tons of new engagement hitting that post ID. And that post ID literally builds up data by itself. And then it'll just expand the potential reach and basically give you a new area of the lake to mine in, right? And the social proof on that becomes incredible. That too. I love social proof, but the bigger thing, it's Facebook seeing all the new potential people it could reach. Because why you start getting a lot of ad fatigue, it's Facebook trying to focus on this one small area of the lake. And you have to go, no, 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 no. There's whole other pockets for you to go to as well. Part of that's just knowing how to play with the algorithm. Yeah. Well, man, there's obviously a wealth of info in that brain. Um, I'll drop a link down below. But one of the things that I just wanted to share with people is that Andrew and I were chit-chatting a little bit before we hit record on this Zoom. And I said, what's on the back end of your uh, of your 
we'll call it a value ladder, whatever, because most people, they assume, hey, a $27 offer, there's got to be some sort of program that's thousands of dollars. And it was like, you know, some people can schedule a call with me if they want, but right now I'm just focusing on So like, if you get in, it's not like you're going to be getting barraged by, by my $1,500 program. Because at this time, a, anyways, I don't have one. I mean, yeah, maybe but, one day. Yeah. Yeah. But right now, so that's pretty cool. No, r- realistically, just to be very candid, this is kind of how I am. I'm a very blunt is what it is guy. The reason I'm selling it 27 bucks is, is twofold. Number one, I want you to really ingrain these philosophies into your business and your advertising because I know it's going to make a world of difference for you. It will. But then number two, I only accept people to work with me if they've gone through the Ad Velocity Masterclass. I have a lot of people every week who, hey, can we hop on a free call? Can we speak about working together? Yeah. You have to buy the Ad Velocity Masterclass first. And then you have the opportunity to hire me as a person to work in your business. So I want you to understand that I have a specific way of operating, a very specific philosophy. And if you're a fit for it, that's wonderful. We can discuss working together. And if you're not, that's okay. I love you. You're fantastic. But we may not be a fit, and that's completely all right. So going forward, I don't accept anybody who has not gone through the Ad Velocity Masterclass. So realistically, this is an opportunity to see, are we a fit to work together? Can I really help you? Are you aligned with how I think? And if so, then we can have an honest and candid discussion. And that's one of the reasons that for your audience, it's 27 bucks. And for everyone else, it's 97. I want to put my my best foot forward and earn your business, right? And I want you to fully understand how I operate. I thought you were giving me like the handsome discount for my audience. I didn't know that. Oh, you are very good looking. <laughs> well, oh, start. <laughs> I always say, I'll give you five minutes to stop then. <laughs> well, cool, man. Well, hey, you know what? I appreciate you hopping on here, especially being sick, coming on and uh, faking some health for us. So thanks for hopping in here. Absolutely. Uh, I uh, am excited for the people who go through it. The people that went through just from my initial Facebook post that I had put up, I've gotten great feedback. I've had a lot of people even coming back saying, hey, where can I find like his videos? Where can I find? So people want more. So that's great. That's a good sign. So appreciate you serving people so well, serving my people so well. And thanks for hopping on. Always. Thank you, sir.